So we saw in the last video why if you represent uh, scheduling constraints among courses by a digraph that it's critical that that digraph in fact be a DAG. And let's now look at this scheduling issue represented by DAGs in more detail. So here's a chart of a selection of uh, course six prerequisites, uh, some of them obsolete, but they serve the purposes of being an illustrative example. And the little arrows here are indicating arrows in the digraph. So what this tells me is that 1801 is listed as an immediate uh, prerequisite in the catalog for 6042. Um, 1801 is also an immediate prerequisite of 1802. Um, uh, 6001 is, and 6004 are both prerequisites of 6033. Uh, uh, and uh, 6042 of 6046 and 6046 of 6840. So we're seeing here uh, this indirect prerequisite issue that I mentioned before, which is that even though the only thing listed as a prerequisite for 6840 in the catalog is 6046, as a matter of fact, in order to take 6046, you have to have taken 6042. So 6042 is an indirect prerequisite of 6840. So uh, in terms of graph language and path language, uh, a subject u is an indirect prerequisite of v when there's a positive length path from u to v in the digraph that describes the prerequisite structure among the classes. Um, it simply means, using our notation for r plus is the positive length path relation of a digraph uh, r, a binary relation r, it simply means u r plus v which is read as there is a positive length path from u to v. Now, a key idea that we're going to be examining in learning how to do scheduling is the idea of a minimal subject. So the definition of a minimal subject is a subject that has no prerequisites, no arrows in a freshman subject. Uh, so nothing comes in. There are three examples of subjects with no prerequisites in the chart, in the preceding chart, namely 1801, 802, and 6001. Let me say a word about where this funny terminology minimal comes from. Uh, it's because another way to talk about DAGs uh, is in terms of things that are like order relations uh, called partial orders, which we'll be looking at shortly. Um, and uh, uh, so you think of the later subjects as being bigger than the earlier subjects. So a minimal subject is one where there's nothing less than it. Um, now there might be several minimal subjects because it might be that neither one of them is less than the other, but there's nothing less than 1801. There's no other subject that you have to take before 1801. So that's the definition of minimal, um, nothing smaller. Now you could ask what's a minimum, which you uh, maybe are more familiar with. A minimum means that not only is there nothing before it, but it comes before everything else. It would be the earliest of all possible uh, subjects in the indirect prerequisite chain. There isn't any in, in this example, but there actually used to be one at MIT. Uh, for a while, we experimented with giving an orientation week summer assignment. Uh, that is a, uh, an assignment over the summer for newly admitted students uh, in order for them to take a subject during orientation week in which they discussed some book that they had all been assigned to read beforehand. It seemed like a great idea to kind of pull the freshman community together, but it turned out to be unsustainable because they couldn't find enough uh, faculty and others willing to conduct these seminars. So MIT stopped having a minimum subject. So let's look at the prerequisites again and uh, discuss how to do a scheduling. And the first thing we're going to do in the schedule is, as I say, identify the minimal elements. There are the three of them that we mentioned. And we're going to start by deciding that we'll take those three in the first term. So we're going to be operating with basically what's called a greedy strategy. We're going to take as many things as we possibly can take uh, at any term given the constraints. So we can take all the freshman subjects in our first term because they have no prerequisites. Well, the next step then is just get rid of them because they're scheduled already. So we can get rid of all those occurrences of 1801, 802, and 6001. Not only the, uh, uh, there are other occurrences as well here where uh, 1801 is a prerequisite for things. So they're all gone and we get a simplified diagram where we've removed the minimal elements. Now in the new diagram, there are now things that didn't used to be minimal before, but are minimal now. These are the new minimal elements, and we can identify those. Here are 
five subjects, four here and one there, that now have no more prerequisites. These are kind of the second level minimal elements, and we're going to schedule them next. So those are all the subjects that we can possibly take um, after we've taken the first set of minimal subjects, the, the second level minimals, and we'll schedule them in the next term. This is our five subject second term schedule. Uh, likewise, well, you delete these guys and then you discover that 6046 and 6004 are the resulting minimal ones, which is now possible to take because all their prerequisites have been satisfied. So we schedule them in the third term, 6840 and 6033 by the same reasoning in the fourth term and 6857 in the fifth term. There is our complete term schedule. Uh, obtained in this particular way. There's, of course, many other ways to schedule it, but this is a particular orderly way where the strategy, again, is greedy. You take as many things as you possibly can take in a given term. Now, there's some concepts that come up when you're talking about schedules that, uh, uh, that are worth introducing. So one of them is an anti-chain. An anti-chain, in, in this particular example, means a set of subjects where there are no indirect prerequisites among them. They can be taken in any order because uh, it doesn't matter whether you've taken one uh, or not when you're thinking about taking the others. Uh, in uh, uh, technical language, again, motivated by the idea of thinking of uh, there being a path as though it was less than or equal to something, these are elements that are incomparable. Neither one is less than or equal to another. So um, in terms of the path relation, u is incomparable to v if and only if there's no path from u to v of positive length and there's no positive length path from v to u. So let's look at some anti-chains. And the part of the point of defining it is we have chosen anti-chains as our schedule for each term. So the freshman subjects with no prerequisites, clearly there's no path among them because there's no path to them at all. So they are an anti-chain. The next level we chose were the, uh, the second level minimal elements, which, which only had as prerequisites the original minimal elements, and so certainly none of them was a prerequisite of the others. So that's an, another example of a, an anti-chain. And of course, the third level and the fourth level and the fifth level are anti-chains, but not all anti-chains are there uh, in our schedule. So for example, here is a diagonal lie, lying anti-chain, 6840, 6004, and 6034 have no paths between them. So in fact, it's possible to take them simultaneously because you could have taken all their prerequisites in the upper left here and then take the three of them. So that's uh, what an anti-chain means here. So the technical definition is no path between any two of them, but in terms of the scheduling of courses, it means it's possible to take them in the same term if you've satisfied all their prerequisites, which it is possible to do. Um, so let's ask about uh, the various uh, patterns of scheduling that are possible. We've discovered this particular greeny one um, where we take as many things as we can each term. But suppose that I was constrained to only take one subject per term. I was going to, I have an outside job. I'm too busy to take more than one class a term. And if MIT will let me dawdle so long, that's what I'd like to do. So can I do this? Yeah, well, sure. Just schedule all the minimal elements first in any order, one, two, three, and then schedule the five second level minimal elements next and the third level and so on. And it's perfectly possible then to modify the schedule that we found into a schedule in which you only take one subject per term. And of course, you only take a subject uh, after you've taken all of its uh, indirect and direct prerequisites. This is called a topological sort. Um, again, uh, the sorting word comes from the motivation of thinking of there being a path as like a less than or equal to relation. So we're sorting things in order of increasing size. 1801 would be, in this case, uh, a smallest element and 6857, a biggest in this list of elements. A chain is kind of uh, technically, literally, a thing called the dual of an anti-chain. Uh, a chain is a sequence of subjects that must be taken in order. 
uh, that is. These are subjects where for any two of them, uh, you know which one has to come first. That is, for between any two of them, there is a path in one way or the other. Now, of course, it's a DAG, so they can't be paths in both directions. So a chain is simply a set of comparable elements, which implies that there's an order in which they have to be taken. So here are some chains. Um, the, this one was shown pictorially as a vertical chain with five uh, courses in it. Here's a, here's a vertical chain of four, and not all of them are vertical. Um, here's a chain where you have to take 1801 before you take 1803 before you take 6004. So they form a chain. Um, it's important to realize that this is a chain with five subjects in it, but a chain doesn't have to have every possible el uh, element uh, that could be in it, it's still a chain even if it's only got these three subjects because there's a path from 802 to 6004 and a path from 6004 to 6857. Um, but maximum length chains, chains that are as full as possible, uh, are uh, important theoretically. And so this in particular is a maximal length chain. The, the, the longest chain here is of length five. Now it's not the only one. There's another chain of length five here if you look for it. But uh, the, no chain is of length longer than five and there is one of length five. And that leads us to the question of how many terms uh, is it necessarily going to take to graduate? Well, we saw that uh, you can graduate in five, and but given that there's a maximum chain of length five, uh, it means that you can't do it in fewer because those five courses have to be taken in cons uh, consecutively. Uh, the, each, the third has to be taken in a term after the first two have been taken. The second has to be taken after the first. If you have a chain of any size, actually, the number of terms to graduate has to be uh, at least as big as that chain, which means it has to be at least as many terms as a maximum size chain. So five terms are necessary, and we saw using our minimal strategy of being greedy that you can always do it in maximum chain length. So five are also sufficient. This is providing that you can take an unlimited number of subjects per term. Remember, our strategy to graduate in five terms was to take as many subjects as we possibly could each term. So there's the sufficient way to take subjects to graduate in five terms. And of course, one consequence is that in my second term, freshman year, I was taking five subjects because it was possible. Uh, but that leaves me with a kind of heavily loaded term compared to here's a term with two subjects and there's a term with only one subject in the, at the very end. Um, so it's possible, in fact, to uh, somewhat adjust the term load. Let's just shift taking 1802 uh, to the uh, third term. It's perfectly feasible to do that because I will have satisfied all the prerequisites of 1802 uh, after the first term, but I don't have to take it in the second term. Let's shift it off. So now I've lightened the load in the second term to four subjects, somewhat increasing the load. I had to do it somewhere in the third term to three subjects. So now I have to take no more than four subjects a term. And as a matter of fact, if you fiddle, you can actually find a graduating uh, schedule in which you can only take three subjects per term. And we will examine uh, what's the minimum number of subjects per term in the next segment.